So welcome to Big Data. No. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ken Armstrong. I've been here like, uh, for the last couple of years. FSU hired my wife to be a, a tenured faculty in the College of Business back in 07, and I came along as the trailing spouse. That's <laughs> awesome. And I, yes, it's, it's a good job. Trailing spouse is a good, yes. a good gig, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, but I've been teaching at University of Arkansas as an uh, executive in residence, just kind of teaching all their... IS classes. So as a non-PhD, when you go into a department, you basically get to teach anything that the tenured faculty don't want to teach. So I taught programming, systems analysis, system design, project <coughs> management, uh, ERP, basically all the classes over my six years there. And one of the classes that I really enjoyed was a database, and we evolved that into a data mining course. And I started getting more involved in it, more interested in it. And then when FSU hired uh, my wife away from Arkansas, I decided, it's like, okay, I've been teaching it for, you know, five years. Let me go out and actually do it. So I uh, hired on to a, a consulting company here in town, and it's a, called Sagetti, where they were a division of Cat Gemini out of France. So I was their business intelligence database geek, hired gun to develop anything along those lines that, that they could sell me on on a project. So I, Really enjoyed that. There was something different every month or two, and saw all kinds of different flavors, all kinds of different uh, needs out in the business community. And I started realizing there's a huge need for those skills out there, and, and universities aren't turning those folks out, uh, at least not at the undergraduate level. Um, if if people if companies want a data scientist or or uh, advanced analytics folks, that's usually at the master's or the PhD level, but the tools that are be becoming more prevalent these days are really getting much easier and simpler to use for the beginners and the undergrads. So an opening uh, opened up in PIC, Programming Interdisciplinary Computing, for uh, it's really the spreadsheets class is what they hired me for. And I teach the advanced uh, spreadsheets called CGS 2518. And it's, it's now up, it's a blended delivery class. It's now up to 1,000 students. Uh, about 200 of those are face-to-face, -face, and the other 800 are all online. So once I got that up and going, my boss said, hey, we hired you because of your you know, Excel skills, but also your, your business analytics skills, your, your BI, business intelligence skills. So, how about developing a course for that? And that's really what I wanted to do anyway when I came here. Excel was just kind of a means to an end, and it, 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 pays, the, it pays the checks. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of the, uh, the beginnings of this course. So some of the, today's objectives, just discover uh, the impetus of the course and the needs that it fulfills in today's data-driven economy. Learn about bit, what big data is and the changing world of analytics. Understand the motivation for and drivers of big data analytics, and then demonstrate some of the technologies used in the course. So, I don't know. If, uh, are you all PhD or grad students? Any faculty? Okay, you're faculty. No, I'm not faculty. I'm an administrator. Okay, great. Well, welcome and thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, so. Just the, the concept of building a course like this from the ground up at a university the size of FSU was, was a challenge in and of itself. So some, I wanted to go into a little bit of the detail of what, what that entailed. So I've kind of got over my, my passion, my personal passion, a little bit of my work history. And then FSU and PIC hired me. And then once I uh, started to build this course, I started interviewing all the people on campus that I designated as the stakeholders. So I talked to several deans, several department heads. PIC is governed by a, a steering committee of basically one or more faculty from all the colleges on campus. And, uh, and everybody had need for some very basic data analytics courses at the undergrad level. A lot of them have it at the advanced, advanced levels, the grad student levels, but Nobody was really doing much with it at the undergrad level. 
Um, then I also reached out to the business community and found out what their needs are and uh, what software, what tools they were actually using because I wanted this course to mainly be a, a course where the students could learn the concepts of, of analytics, how to apply it in the marketplace, and then get their hands on some tools. So, you know, I'm a very uh, hands-on learning centric person. If, once I do, once my hands do it a couple times, I figure it out and then I, I, my mind starts wandering and then I start figuring out where, what are the places I can apply it to. So I really wanted it to be a, a, in a lab setting. So we have, uh, this semester we have 35 students in a lab and basically we'll cover it. The flow of the course is pretty uh, iterative. We start with a lecture on a topic, then we, the next class period we'll have a lab. Then a follow-up lecture and then uh, a homework assignment will be due on that two-week rotation. So we pretty much roll through that two-week iteration over and over and over through the whole semester. So the students, almost every other class, are having their hands on some big data tool. And it's not stuff that you typically find on the average desktop. We're talking about millions or hundreds of millions of rows and all kinds of different data sets for, for all kinds of different purposes. So we, I, figured out all the needs from all the stakeholders and we kind of chose the top five. Then I invested the technologies. And in investigating the technologies, there's a lot of a lot of issues with that. One is finding there was no money for toys and tools in the course, of course. So finding enterprise level tools and data sets that can be administrated with with very little overhead. Uh, in fact, no overhead other than just my time. So finding the access to the enterprise, the enterprise level tools and then finding real world data sets is also a big challenge. And the data sets need to be diverse and geared towards the audience because if you give a, a group of students just a big spreadsheet full of zeros and ones and tell them to analyze it, they're just going to uh, really? What? <laughs> What I'm, okay, I'm doing some regression on this column, I'm predicting that, but I don't understand what any of that is. So coming up with data sets that they understand uh, in real world situations and then letting them do the, take the mental leap and applying it into whatever their, their passions are was a big challenge. So the, the topics that I basically chose, the first one is just basic statistics, since this is an undergrad level class. and I'm in the program in interdisciplinary computing. I'm just going to call it PIC because that's way too many syllables to say over and over and over. So PIC is geared towards uh, teaching computer classes to the entire university. So if any, any class computer related is best taught across the entire campus, we try to make ourselves an ideal home for that or an ideal situation for that. So we're not pushing an individual department's agenda, whether it's MIS or IT or computer science or, or statistics. We, we're not there to push our curriculum on, on our majors. We don't have any majors. There's three and a half of us in the department. One guy teaches uh, programming. Uh, one, uh, another faculty teaches web design and web programming. And then I teach spreadsheets. And then we have a an adjunct faculty that teaches uh, graphic design. So those are all computer-related classes that anybody on campus can, can utilize to further their, their, their career. So I had to uh, start off with just some basic statistics because I can't count on my studio art majors having any statistical knowledge. And I have, that's, this course is a very popular course for studio art majors for some reason. I don't know if they're wanting to get into business later on and, and or maybe they're fascinated with the visualization portion of the class or something, but they're, I usually have two or three out of that major every semester. So uh, no prerequisites, so we have to start off with just some leveling of the student knowledge. We talk about, at a very high level, just some data architectures. There's what's referred to as structured data, data that's sitting in a database, or in a data warehouse, or some structured flat file, Excel file, that's already 
you know, columns and rows and stuff. Then we have unstructured data, such as social networking, uh, the amount of data that's being generated on a second-to-second -second basis by YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all that is unstructured data. And it's very difficult to analyze using traditional uh, statistical analysis tools. If you want to take a, a, a big Twitter feed, you know, maybe uh, somebody's, uh, we're doing this project now, I let students go out and get 50 reviews of some product or movie or something that they're interested in, and we do sentiment analysis on it. So just copying and pasting it and just into this one tool that we use to find out the feeling and the uh, different facets of the different comments. So, for instance, uh, just downloading a hotel database or a hotel Twitter feed. Oh, the front staff was was very rude. You know, being able to kept, catch topics like that that are embedded into the natural language processing or into the, of the actual field, we actually get into some of that later in the semester. So we do some unstructured data using a variety of uh, technologies. The main one we use at this level is Teradata. They're one of the major uh, data warehouse vendors for the world. And uh, I'll provide these, these slides where the end, and these are all hot links that you can actually go and, and look and, and see what some of the stuff we're doing. We do data visualization. Uh, that's a huge hot topic in, in, uh, in the business world these days. And we use a product, one, uh, one of the leading vendors in the world is called Tableau. We do a data cleansing module because rarely all the data that you accumulate it's rarely clean, consistent, you know, always, there's always something that has to be done to, to, to make it right so that you can analyze it in a coherent manner. So we use SQL Server, a new product that they came out with a couple years ago, Data Quality Services. You see here the, these partnerships. This was one of the keys to getting this class to work. Because I said earlier that one of the constraints I had was, you know, there's not a whole lot, there's no financial support on campus for new technologies. And like if I were to go to the, the network administrators and say, hey, I want a, a SQL server set up with, you know, 8 gig of RAM and, and, you know, 2 terabytes of data storage, they say, well, write me a check and I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> so there are, I, I joined several of these alliances that allow, that are set up to work with academia. So, for instance, Microsoft has an academic alliance. By me joining that and getting my students to join that, that uh, we were able to get all the students to have complete access to a, about a $10,000 suite of tools that they can use in an academic setting for a semester. Cool. So they can all download the SQL Server and all the data mining, and, and uh, they can even download Windows out of it and make virtual machines if they want. So we do even a little bit of that for some of the some of the poor Macintosh users. I don't see any Macs. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> for real. If, if I can ask you a question. Yes. Uh, so just with the EDU account, you can access Microsoft Academia? Mm-hmm. So mm -hmm. anyone can do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we do text mining, which I was referring to a couple minutes ago, the sentiment analysis. That's an ex It's actually just a third-party Excel add-in from, from Symmetria. And all we have to do, I, I, I just work it out ahead of time, saying, hey, I've got 40 students, I need 40 licenses. They send me a, a spreadsheet with 40 licenses on it, and I, I give them to all the students, and then they get to install it on their lab machine in the College of Business, and, uh, and a personal laptop as well. So you know, get that going for free. Data mining, we'll talk about some of this. We do some association analysis, a.k.a. market basket. Uh, cluster analysis, a little regression, and we use Teradata. And Teradata has a Teradata University network, where if you subscribe to that, they give you access to hardware and software. So there's a, at the University of Arkansas, back when I worked there, I actually set up a lot of data sets there. That was one of my jobs. And they are part of the Teradata University network. So anybody that's a member of that group, and it's free also for all of academia, has access to all the software and hardware. All they have to do is uh, connect up to their servers 
and boom, you've got all their data, all their hardwares. They maintain the servers. It doesn't cost us anything. And the students get to work on real world data sets. Like one of the data sets that I've got there is all the Sam's Club stores. 150 stores for 15 months of sales. So I have all the transaction sales data for 150 stores for 15 months, which is about a billion records. So having students play with a billion records, they're, they're, they're never exposed to that. They go through an average class, and the biggest data set they might have is 50 or 100 rows or something. It's like, okay, well, here's one table with you know, 842 million. Run this query and see what happens. Oh, I'm afraid to hit go. It's like, just do it. Hit the F5 key and it's all good. And it comes back with an answer right away because it's all set up and it's maintained by somebody else. And all I have to do at the beginning of each semester is say, yeah, I need, I got 35 students. Give me 35 licenses. I'm done. But getting to that point, finding all those alliances and, build, and, and building that out was a big challenge of the, of the course prep. Um, now a little bit about the course itself, some of the learning objectives, and I just copied this out of the syllabus, but it's basically a, a learning objective for each of those technologies that, that we did. You know, teaching them some base, basic analytic techniques, using some cutting edge technologies, uh, support better decision making, you know, discover the different places that data resides. So we talk about different types of databases, transactional databases versus data warehouses versus flat files, and how to, how to take that data and move it from one venue to another. You cleanse it, you move it, and transform it to run some of your basic statistics against it. So we do, we learn how to do all that. And there, again, I'll give you the, the link, or give you this file, and it's got the link to the syllabus. Some of the course demographic data, uh, it's, this semester, it's usually about the same. It's usually about a 60-40 male-female split. About 60% of the students are from the College of Business, and the other 40% are from everywhere. You know, I got uh, criminology. I have uh, art, you know, studio design. I have uh, Italian majors up there. I don't, I don't know why, but, but but they were interested, and they thought it, thought it sounded like fun, and they took it. And they've uh, they've done very well with it. Everybody's done really well with the, with the data, because... If they take the course, they're generally interested in data, and I try to have the, the learning modules interesting and fun enough that they can, they can all get value out of it. It's all Blackboard based. Uh, it's not technically a distance learning class, but I use the ODL's distance learning template to fulfill as many of the, uh, the quality matters rubric as possible. That's, that's one of our initiatives in PIC. We work with John Braswell. You know him at all? He's, He's like one of the Blackboard gurus on campus, and he uh, worked with us to, to, init to get his, our courses in line with the Quality Matters rubric. Have you guys worked with that at all, or you know what I'm talking about with the Quality Matters? I see a couple. Um, there are five assignments, four are individual, one's a group project with a, with a summary presentation at the end. There's two exams that are multiple choice and essays. Any question on the course itself or the format of, of what it's what it's about? Feel free, and I'm I don't know if you can tell, but I'm very informal. Please ask if, if I uh, don't go into enough detail about something, or if you, you know, have any questions, please interrupt. And this is very informal. I'm sorry. So, which platform do you use for the course Blackboard? Yes. So the course is on Blackboard. Okay. Yes. Uh, and when students run the data analysis, uh, that's run actually by Microsoft, for example. So it's not the computer that has to do the work? It, it Correct. Right. I create, um, every Windows machine has what's referred to as a remote desktop assistant, a remote desktop client, which allows you to create a tunnel to another server, another machine. As long as that machine is set up and we set up the right parameters, then I'll for instance, I can go into. Let's see here. So there's no problem of like the computer freezing or because of the, the big amount of data. No, okay. because for instance, here's a remote desktop connection. I'm currently connected to the Teradata University Network, WaltonCollege.uark.edu. 
and this is the SAMS Club database with 850 million rows. So it's all on their machine, their servers. The only processing that takes place on the Windows machine is just a tunnel to, it's like a VPN connection into their servers. So they're, all the queries and the, and the, all the analytics is actually going on on their side and it just travels through the, through the pipeline to the Windows machine. So the, about the only criteria is that it has to be on a Windows machine because all this data is so encrypted the Mac doesn't have a, a, a VPN client that's encrypted enough to to talk to their talk to these systems. But you can create you can access Windows using a Mac. Too. That, that's <laughs> yes, what, what I do for my Mac users is I've created a virtual machine mm -hmm. that's a Windows virtual join, machine, and I just download it onto their hard drive and say, "Here's a 50 gigabyte Windows machine running in the background on on your Mac." And then from there, they can then tunnel into the data and the systems from that. So we can even do it on a Mac machine. It just requires me to download a virtual machine and then take up you know, 50 gigabytes of hard drive space. So they have to clear off some of their music and their videos to, 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 to work in the class. But it's, it's easy enough to do. Did you have a question? Um, I mean, this is more like a distributed um, computing approach. To yes. The, yeah. So you don't need to worry about your computing the classroom machines don't require any software, <laughs> any cool. configuration other than the only thing I, I usually do is have them uh, create a shortcut to the remote desktop <laughs> compliant on the desktop so that they don't have to type in the command line it's like MSTSC <laughs> or something that, that confuses them. So we try to make it as simple and straightforward as possible. And, uh, yes? about this uh, using MySQL to, to conduct data analysis. I remember it's a software, right? A MySQL is a software. The, we can download it. Oh, the, the, I've set it up so that there's no need to download it. Um, it's all running on somebody else's machines. Okay. Some of the, so, uh, at least the big data sets, yeah. I leave all the software on the remote servers. Okay. Um, the Excel add-in that does the sentiment analysis, then the students download it and install that. But even that requires you know, 10 people on campus to sign off that it's okay to install this software on this lab machine. And it takes months to get everything approved just to be able to get some software installed. It's just an Excel add-in. So I try to avoid having to have any software installed onto the lab machines. For instance, I moved classrooms. I was in HCB 308 for the first year and a half. And then I moved over to the College of Business. Well, I had to have all that, all that software that I did install, I had to go through it all again to get it installed in the College of Business because they own their lab machines and the and it's a whole different hierarchy network just to get anything installed on, on machines there. So just finding my way through the university web of entanglements to get stuff installed from one classroom to another <coughs> can be daunting. So you just need to keep that in mind when you're using software in a class. That if you need something installed, it's going to take time and effort. So just a, a, any other questions? Those are excellent questions. Any other questions just on the, the, the way out of that or why? Um, Fabrizio asked me to go into a little bit about big data itself. Is that, is that cool? Yeah. So what is big data? What most people think is it's just bigger data sets. It's, it's bigger databases. It's, it's wider files. It's bigger spreadsheets. It's really much more than that. It's a collection data set so large and complex and varied that it becomes difficult to process using database management tools or traditional processing applications. That's uh, Hadoop's version of it. 
So what is big data in reality? It's, it's become a buzzword and it means different things to different people. Uh, it's a catchphrase used to describe massive volumes of both structured and unstructured data is the key component that makes big data so difficult. It's because it's unstructured, it could be video files, it could be PDFs, it could be images, it could be text files, it could be web pages, it could be social networking analysis generated by Google or, or Facebook, and just getting all that data and dumping it onto a server and then being able to analyze that without going through the months of, of rigmarole to get it embedded into a database so that you can then analyze it. Yes? Uh, how to analyze like uh, video clips? How to yes. cha analyze video clips? Yes. yes. So yeah, uh, being able to analyze those for the content. Yes. That's, yes. That's why I'm asking. Oh, oh, okay. oh, how? Yes. Oh, how? <laughs> <laughs> well, the the easiest way is if um, the like YouTube, you can embed the script along with it. Those are easier to analyze because then you have the script files that go along with it. So it kind of depends on the on the capacity of the of the of the source of where the the you or the the videos are held. You know, if, if it has the ability to parse it out and give you the text meanings of it. Maybe the tag of the video. I'm sorry. Maybe the videos are tagged. Maybe you can analyze tag. according to the tag. Mm -hmm. Tags. Yep. Tag. Mm -hmm. uh, how about so you can add a detailed analysis on video? I must use the software with the transmit called Transmit to analyze the video. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, nice. What is it called? Transmit. Transmit. T-R-A-N-S-A-N-A. Yeah, it's a software. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. Because I'm all about I'm all about tools and getting the students' hands on stuff that's easy and usable. So excellent. For instance, the internet, the internet alone produces one exabyte of data daily. Uh, that's a million terabytes <laughs> a day. And that's just the internet. That's not all the companies generating their data. So that's about uh, 250 million DVDs every day generated on the internet. So just figuring out ways to analyze that large a chunk of data actually requires a whole different type of technology and software that's, that people are just now, it's been out for two or three years, uh, Hadoop is one of the major players in that in that field. And we, we do just a little bit with it. Uh, you know, where is all this used? Uh, scientists, analysts, analysts regularly encounter limitations, meteorology, genomics, uh, so studying the human genome, uh, physics, Environmental research, internet searches, finance, business intelligence, sentiment, sensor data <coughs> on seemingly everything now. Even a jet engine generates about one, 20 terabytes of data an hour every time it runs. All the sensors inside one jet engine generate that much data from all the sensors in it. So, you know, to take that back to conduct maintenance records on requires huge amount of technology and huge data sets. So why is it important? MIT IBM study, top performing organizations are using analytics five times more often than lower performers. 50% 50 50 of the respondents said that improvement in information and analytics was a top priority in their organizations. 20% said they're under intense significant pressure. They're really, they're starving for this information for graduates that have some exposure to these technologies. Um, every week this semester, students that have come back, uh, that are in my class, are coming back in and say, hey, I was in this job interview and I talked about what we're doing in this class and they wanted me back like right then. They could have just ended the interview right then and, would, and I would have gotten a, a, a trip to the corporate factory. Uh, so I think about, like I said, about 60% of the class is, is IS, and uh, everybody is benefiting from this class. And they're making good, they're making really good money for, 
or an undergrad that's coming out with, with really no work history. I mean, 50, 60 grand for, for just having a regular, regular major and this class, it's been, it's been crucial for them and they're, uh, they're soaking it up. The classes, it started out with a dozen students, then I went to 20, and then I moved it to another class, now we're at 35. Next semester, I'm uh, splitting it up into two different sections of 35, so it's 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 ramping up very very quickly, and pretty soon I'm gonna have to figure out a way to scale it to 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 roll it out without any additional manpower in our department, because I'm sure we're not gonna get any new faculty line items. So that's, but that's the reality of education. Yes. So what's the typical job that um, someone who's working with big data is doing? It depends on their major. For instance, if you're a, um, a marketing major, mm -hmm. you need to be able to understand the sentiment, uh, be able to understand what what products are 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 selling, which ones are profitable, which ones are unprofitable, uh, where your customers are located, um, MIS, the people that uh, they're going to be more in the background, creating the data structures and creating the data warehouse and and amassing the data and pulling it in from the web and storing it on the servers. So, um, it, every different major, finance, um, I, I'm meeting with a group of actuaries tomorrow talking about this. It's crucial. Yes? Is this a core course, required course for the undergraduates in marketing or, may, or any of the business majors? No, it's, it's uh, in the college business they just created a, a business analytics minor. And this is included in that minor, but even the minor is just, it's an option. But it's, it, it just started in the fall, and already that's a huge uh, chunk of the growth. After they get it ironed out and they get the minor ironed out, they're going to offer it to the entire university. So it will be available to everybody. And by then, you know, different departments across campus, I'm sure, will have something similar or whatever. But... That's one of the nice things about this, the interdisciplinary nature of this course. It can be, it's meant for everybody. It's meant for all majors. And I try to use data that everybody knows, and it's, it's not just a marketing class or a, an IS, IT class. It's literally usable for everybody. Otherwise, it wouldn't be good inside our department, which is just interdisciplinary. So everything that we do has to be has to have an interdisciplinary focus. We were reading in <coughs> Dr. Bedden, uh, web, web Analytics, and Early Analytics, uh, on the book, it's called Big Data, uh, by Mayer Schromberger. Mm -hmm. um, they basically, they were using big data, they, with Big Data, they, uh, they found out at Walmart that when there was a storm, uh, people were buying more certain products before. <laughs> Yeah. You, want, you, have, you want to see that? You want to see that actual data? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. go, go on with your story. And, and so every time that there's a tornado or we were okay in alert, yeah. uh, at Walmart they were putting out the, yeah. that kind of product. I think it was sweet food or something like this. Chop, the number one food associated with hurricanes. Strawberry Pop Tarts. Oh, yeah, I see. <laughs> you think plywood or, or, or water? No, it's that. strawberry Pop Tarts. <laughs> Frosted, not the, not the plain ones. Oh, so that's a, a great strategy, marketing strategy. Yeah. They, we think we are making our own decisions, but how can we are driven by the yeah. market? Yeah, the idea is to analyze what's happened and see if, if it's indicative of the future. And then and then plan for that. And so there's different types of analytics, and one of them is called predictive analytics, where you're being able to predict the future based on the past with some level of certainty. Then we, we talk about that. So, let's see, if, does this work? So here's, a, I created a, a this is just one, one store with 167,000 rows of data in it for one month. And I, so we, I don't teach them SQL, but if it's in a database, you need to be able to, to write some queries. So if any student, if I ever ask them to query the database to find something out, I always just give them the, give them the SQL. Uh, so for instance, you know, select everything from my store ordered by visit number. Uh, let me show you like one, 
one query here. Let's pick out just one visit. So when you get when one person goes to a store and fills up their shopping cart with something, what did they buy? So here's one visit, store number three, from this person. They bought $153 worth of stuff. Here's what it costs. Oops. And what did they buy? They bought one of all these, two of those, and three of those. So they bought one dill chip that size, king pretzels, American processed cheese, chicken patties, squeezed ketchup, ground beef patties, butterfly shrimp, breaded chicken, and french fries. That sounds like Super Bowl weekend. It, it was, <laughs> it was January. It could well be. That's a, when was the date? That, I bet I've yeah. never. <laughs> it sounds like something you'd have for Super Bowl. January 2nd. So it's a couple weeks uh, yeah. prior to yeah. Super Bowl. <laughs> but and that was a point. darn good guess. So, but, that, but that's the, the cool thing about using this data. Pretty much everybody that's ever been to a Sam's Club can visualize me going up with a shopping cart filled with this stuff. And then looking on here and you know seeing what it looks like in a database. And then you can go over to uh, to do some data mining on it. Let's see. So let's say I want to do what's referred to as a market basket or association analysis. When people buy one thing, how often do they buy something else? Uh, the the age-old uh, one that uh, Walmart originally bragged about was when people buy diapers, they end up buying beer at the same time. And they dug into it. They found, they ran this software that we've got here, and they ran an affinity that there's a high likelihood if you're buying diapers, you're also buying beer. And what they dug into it and found out was men coming home from work would call home and say, hey, I'm on my way home, can you get me something? And the wife would say, oh, get me some diapers. So he goes to Sam's Club and gets diapers and says, oh, well, while I'm here, I'll get a case of beer, too. I have to stay home tonight. Yeah. If I'm going to have to change all these diapers, I'm going to need some beer. So, for instance, here's the, here's the software. That, uh, it's called Teradata Warehouse Miner. And you literally put in a, a grouping column, so you group it by the visit number, and then what items do you want to include in a visitor? What do you want to find out when one thing is purchased, what other things are purchased? And then come over here to results. And they can, here's like Heineken, there's a 7 up to Pepsi, 48% of the time. So whenever somebody buys 7 up, 48% of the time they also bought Pepsi. Sprite to Coke. Uh, Why now? Columns a little bit so you can see. When you buy C's, you also buy double A batteries, triple A to double A. You know, some of these are pretty, you know, corn to green beans, hamburger buns to hot dog buns. So you can see in here, you can see the odds of that combination of stuff happening. So then, you know, a manager or a finance person, you know, that's concerned about profitability, might look at this data from one way. If if they're the uh, store marketing personnel, you might be, well, I, if people buy these two things, do I put a, want to put them next to each other so that it's convenient to get them both, or do I want to put them on opposite ends of the store so that if if they're going to buy diapers, you have to walk through the whole store and see everything on the way in order to get the beer. So there's different schools of thought, we, yeah. you know, so it's, it's uh, for different reasons. A, a little uh, small question. Uh, well, <clears throat> um, when we were doing this pattern analysis, it is the um, software to determine the pattern or it is we to uh, first do some preliminary and uh, analysis treatment to this data set or um, something. Um, I'm I, I mean, because... Uh, um, uh, let me think how, how to put this. Um, well, um, you can um, discover some um, patterns during um, in this data set, mm -hmm. and uh, it should be a particular threshold um, that you define that, that there is a pattern. So it is you to determine this threshold or 
It is the software to. No, I, yeah, I've kind of refined the pra the parameters. Uh huh. I, I, I skimmed over it, but over here on the input section, you can go into analysis parameters, and here's where you can set in the thresholds of uh -huh. how how much you want to put in, and that's one of the homework criteria uh -huh. that they have to determine the right. Uh, or the right threshold uh -huh. to get about 500 records. Give me the top 500 hits. Because if you leave it set incorrectly, it'll generate you know a million different records and, it'll, and the software will just melt to say, hey, I can't handle this. So it's a matter of learning what the parameters are and adjusting them to get a, a, the right answer in the homework. So that's, that's built into it as well. Uh -huh. That's astute, very good. And you can do one-to-one -one combinations one to two, so when they buy these two things, what else do they buy? There's a lot of flexibility in the parameters of these algorithms. For instance, we also do, let's see. Do some cluster analysis. get the resolution on the, on the screen very well, but I actually put some bad data in into the data. So this, this assignment here is the very last project at the end of the semester, so they know about bad data, they know how to cleanse it. So I give them a store with some bad data in it, when they run like a cluster analysis with the bad data, I told, it, I told them to find two clusters. And ultimately the goal of it was to find all of the, the different types of customers of uh, personal shoppers versus corporate sponsors. If you break all the all the millions of records into two clusters, it'll actually break it out into those two different groups. And with the outliers in it, it comes up with just a horrible, the clusters are, are, are gigantic and enormous because you have some bad data in there that's causing people to buy like a million dollars worth of stuff because of the bad data. But if they go in after they fix it, And we can come up with these two nice, neat little clusters. Here's the, the residential or the, the personal users buy like 80, 80, or the, about $80 on the average, and they buy, they buy about 10 to 20 items or in their shopping basket. Versus corporate, they're buying about 40 items at a time at close to $200 a piece. So just teaching them a little bit about cluster analysis and then running it on, hey, when you got bad data, your clusters are, are this big and, and useless. Eliminate the data and say, hey, we got these nice tight little circles now, and now you can do some segmenting of your data and, and hone in on your predictions of, of uh, trying to, to influence the predictions and the, and the outcomes. Yes? So you just showed us like sand data. How many companies do like make public their data? Very few. <laughs> and even this Sam's Club, it's been scrubbed quite a bit, and I can't dive into the demographics of who these people are and how much they make, or you know, male, female. No, they don't give us any of that. Is it live data where you're, like, if you were to go one week and then go back another week, or is this data that they've given you they've a given, specific time? They've, they gave us 15 months worth of data back in the year 2000. Gotcha. Uh, and they're, the University of Arkansas is in the process of getting the latest Sam's Club data, but it's going to be another six months or so before they get it available to the masses. But, but this data is very useful to the students because they can visualize what, what's going on. We can do, I, I originally planned on using you know, 
letting the students come up with their own data sets on something that interested them. And I've done that on some projects with some, some special students, that, but it's very difficult to them, for them to come up with a data set that has a million rows in it that's something interesting. Uh, you know, one was really into engines and was going to, went off, he's uh, starting up his own auto body shop and he wanted to do uh, engine analysis for this and he came up with a data set that had like 50 rows in it. It's like, not going to be able to do much statistical analysis on 50 rows, but that's the challenge with letting the students pick their own data. Uh, but it's, the, course, <coughs> the course could very easily do that if, if, if they had data sets. If we had some folks that were in the sciences and they had experimental data that they wanted to do. I've done some of that. I did one project uh, one semester with uh, some of my wife's uh, dissertation data. And we ran some very statistical analysis on it and tried to use it to predict um, the, oh, uh, learning curves for object-oriented programmers versus uh, traditional mainframe programmers. And mainframes are being mothballed and, and uh, taken down and converted over to Windows or Java or whatever, and they're having to retrain all their all their uh, programmers. Very cost uh, costly, time-consuming <coughs> event. And she did her dissertation on ways to get them up to speed as quickly as possible. So we, we used some of that data. That was a little over a lot of the students' head, especially for the non the non technical students in the class. So. I didn't use that one again. Everybody understood this one. So. Let's see, trying to be cognizant of time. It looks like I'm about out. Let me see if there's anything else on the PowerPoints. Uh, it just talks about why the course exists, you know, uh, salary ranges for the sexiest job in the 21st century, according to Harvard Business <laughs> Review. Uh, it's growing incredibly rapidly, huge shortage. Uh, I just showed you the uh, tear data. We've also got one other uh, was Tableau data visualization software, which is the students really enjoy, especially the, the, the creative ones. So for instance, here we have a bunch of uh, products, and they were as they were sold throughout the throughout the world, and how much they were sold. This is a software called Tableau, and you can break it down by here we have furniture, office categories, technology, by sales region, and you can come in here and just click on here and do different types of charts based on on all that. There's mapping software that's built into it. Uh, scatter plots. You can assemble all the different charts, visualizations into dashboards. Um, and it's very easy to do. For instance, if I want to find out all the sales for every state in America, I could just come in here and I click on state, and I hit the control key and hit sales, and then just come over here and say, hey, I want this map here. And it creates a, a bubble chart based on that. The bigger the bubble, the higher the sales. Or if I want a, a, a color chart, so the, the darker the shade, and then I can come over here and say, oh, show me the profit and include that in each state. Just by dragging it that quickly. It's that easy to generate every imaginable type of visualization out there. Uh, I had a few other examples. You know, with uh, more scientific data, drug use around the world, uh, oil consumption or energy specific consumption. There's all kinds of really cool data sets that we work on and visualize in class. But uh, that's that's the basics of the course. So it's it's set up. It's it's growing. It's uh, it's getting better. Uh, whether or not it scales to on, to Online or not, I don't know. It's, it, it, by its nature, currently it's set to be very, very hands-on, and uh, it would be kind of might be difficult to scale out to an online class. But you never know. We, it, it, 
it's theoretical. Yes. How students? Students usually react to the course because I, I guess they don't have a, a clear idea when they start the course. So uh, at, the, at the end of the course, are they like surprised positively? Or yes. <laughs> uh, one of the I get very high reviews on the on the teaching evaluations, and I get a lot of comments like, "I thought this class was gonna." not be fun. <laughs> I'll be kind to myself here, <laughs> considering the crowd, I don't know you all. Uh, but I really enjoyed it, or I'm surprised that I really enjoyed the class. Uh, so that's kind of a good a good sign. Uh, and I thought that it would just be technical people signing up for it, but it's 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 everybody and and the students are sharp enough here to to grasp the need for it and and dig into it. And, Generally, they'll only come in if they have some type of a passion for data. You know, they're not going to just take it uh, just because it's an elective, a 3,000 level elective, you know, and they want to burn the three credit hours and the how much that is, you know, five, or I don't know how much, whatever the rate is for tuition. But yes? Well, you almost talk about the business and the marketing. What about the educational side? I mean, well, uh, we can, I know, we, we have meta-analysis for, uh, meta for the education side. So can we use this method to analyze the, for example, about a topic, about the education topic over the world, how many published, how many dissertation, how many articles they published. Can we do this with this? Oh, very easily. Very easily. Yeah. So, Just need the data set. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's you can read the data set, I can analyze it, I can visualize it, I can slice, I can dice. That's just to the visualize the data, right? Yes. To get in the data is again another problem. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's that's where the researchers come in and they, they define the surveys and they, they define the, the goals of their research and they amass the data. Once you get it, then what do you do with it? This, this course is more... On, on those lines, you know, the, the, we don't go into a lot of the accumulation techniques because that's usually done by some system or some researcher or some somebody some entity. And then once it's at rest, mm -hmm. then spinning it through and, and running it through the data mining algorithms. And I usually have the I have my, my mining helmet on <laughs> during, during those classes. I mean, you know, you're mining for data. You've got this huge data set. You're trying to find the gems in the data that, that mean something. So I always have it whenever I, we talk in that lecture. So I always put on my data mining Safe helmet. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question. I <laughs> sidestepped it. Right? <laughs> That's out of scope. <laughs> Somebody else's problem. Can we pull the data from, I mean, from the different databases, for example, Science Direct or ProQuest? Can we pull the data from there, or we again need to the data set? They, they should turn. It. <laughs> if, right? if they make them public, uh -huh. and every different journal is going to have different uh, That's constraints true. on their data. Uh -huh. so some some do publish it. Or maybe you can pull it out of the library system. You know? mm -hmm. uh, there's all kinds of databases out there that have stuff by author, by topic, by keyword, by uh, abstract. What you could do, what uh, some researchers have done, they wanted to know what what the hot topics were in the top IS yeah. journals. Exactly. So they took all the abstracts mm -hmm. from all the MISQ, ISR, and um, MI, uh, I can't remember the third journal. They took all the abstracts out and ran them through that uh, text mining okay. software yeah. to determine what, and then did cluster What's analysis. Topic? Well, uh -huh. these are the nine topics that that were hot mm -hmm. over a course of a, a decade and plotted it over time. You know, here's one topic that was started off slow and real high and then tapered down. And so, you know, if, if I were a researcher, what I want to do research on that. As you can see in the journals, you're not, it's getting much more difficult to get published over now on that particular topic. So once the data is there, then you run various statistical analysis on it that help you mine and figure out what the, <laughs> what the, what the pertinent information is. <clears throat> and have you found any um, data with educational analytics? Learning Do you have any? Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't personally looked for it yet, but I'm sure it's out there. 
and I'd be happy to work with, with anybody here that uh, that has it, or that has a, a passion for it, that, uh, that we can see what, what it, what's in it and run it through the run it through the ringer and see if it tosses anything out on the floor. That's a big part of data mining is, yeah. is just knowing the data, knowing what it is and what, what hopefully what it can tell you. But then you have the different uh, theories and the hypothesis, and then you just hammer it to death with statistics until it comes out with, with an answer. You know, that's a big part of, of uh, that's what a lot of research 